हेलो सर यू आर ऑन म्यूट सर या या आई नो आई आई पुट माय सेल्फ ऑन म्यूट ओके हेलो हाय हाउ आर यू आई एम गुड आई एम गुड Let's wait for a couple of more minutes. Uh, yeah. We'll wait for some more students to join. Uh, how much is the time? Uh, we can speak for like forty-five, forty, forty-five minutes, and then we can leave the question open for questions and discussion. Okay. Is okay. a request to all the other participants. You are on mute, sir. Yeah, yeah I know. I uh, I put myself on mute. Yeah, this is okay. a request. Hello, hi. How are you? हेलो दिस इज अ रिक्वेस्ट टू ऑल दी अदर पार्टिसिपेंट्स इफ यू आर नॉट स्पीकिंग काइंडली म्यूट योर माइक Sir, I'm ready to start when you are. Okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so hi everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, we are yet again joining for a conversation. Uh, today we are going to be having a conversation with uh, Father Joseph. Uh, I'll just give a small introduction of Joseph, sir. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, Joseph, sir, is a professor at. Uh, well, you can't put in can you? Professor uh, Professor Joseph is a prof uh, assistant professor at uh, uh, Mumbai University at for the Department of Sociology, mm -hmm. and uh, he has his areas of uh, work are on religion and society. Uh, uh, this is a request to those of you who are uh, not speaking. Please kindly mute your mic. yes so professor joseph is like i was saying uh, a faculty at uh, mumbai university and uh, he is a faculty of uh, sociology uh, department of sociology uh, previously he was uh, a professor at saint xavier's and uh, most of his uh, research work area is uh based on understanding contemporary religious identity of uh, buddhists from maharashtra and he has also done his phd on the same and he will be discussing about that with us today uh he is also somebody who uh, teaches anthropology at, and i know for a fact that it is one of his most uh, light subjects and uh, he teaches anthropological theory ethnography and uh, one of his other areas of work is also understanding religion through the perspective of gender uh, he has co-authored a book called reimagining sociology from uh, in india from feminist perspective and he, he has co-edited with uh, dr geeta chadda who is also a professor at the university so uh, welcome joseph sir it was real, it's really nice to have you uh, joseph sir for today's discussion can you uh, start with Uh, sharing what exactly is the history of the buddhist movement and uh, how what is what before we and before we get into that what is the role of conversion like how do we understand conversion and then we can take that forward um so i, I will start with um, how do we actually understand religious conversion in general uh then uh, I, i would prefer that it's a conversation that's better you know 
rather yeah. than I holding forth all the time. Absolutely. I've just, I just finished one holding forth for two hours. I'm already fed up. So. <laughs> I will pitch it wherever I can. Okay. And we can also ask and, our and, uh, participants and also, to... And also the participants like, you know, uh, you would like to pitch in somewhere uh, and I would like this to be a conversation and uh, that's better. Yeah. Yes. All right. if, just a moment. Before we start, uh, if the participants have any comments or any questions to share, they can always write in the chat box. So I will keep the chat box open. Uh, and if there is any discussion that is coming forth from the other side, we can take that up. Okay, over to you, Joseph, sir. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Abha, for that introduction and uh, thanks for inviting me for this uh, interaction. And uh, I also am happy to uh, see uh, that uh, 13 of you are there and your names are there. I, I would have liked to get introduced to you, but, you know, there is no time. So I will straight away uh, go to the, the thing. Am I, am I uh, clearly audible? Yes, quite. Yes, sir. Yeah, fine, fine. All right. Uh, so... Um, um, how do we understand religious conversions? Um, uh, so in a, in a nutshell, I will try to uh, look at it uh, because this is one of the, uh, among the many politically charged kind of uh, debates in India, one of them is this, and uh, it gets tied up with our colonial past, um, the idea that uh, colonialism and conversion are con uh, connected at some level. And then, uh, you know, in the 19th century, they were... Uh, conversion movements in some parts of North India mainly where a larger number of uh, indigenous communities and some Dalit communities got converted to some to Islam and some to Christianity and some to Christianity in uh, significantly large numbers in Chotanagpur area around Ranchi and, uh, and obviously uh, uh, some tribes got converted to Christianity also in the Northeast, especially among the Nagas, the, uh, the, 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 the Mizos and uh, others and a few others, uh, also the, among the Rabhas, among the uh, Bodo also to some extent. So a lot of those tribes got converted to Christianity as well. Um, so that is, uh, uh, in a natural the way that uh, the idea of conversion became a politically charged kind of uh, uh, a discourse uh, because of its connection with colonialism. Uh, and uh, when we became uh, a nation, uh, when we uh, got independence mm -hmm. from the colonial system, uh, conversion became one of the flashpoints that was always uh, talked about. So way back in the 1950s, we had the Madhya Pradesh government actually uh, commissioning a committee, a commission for that, the Niyogi Commission. The Niyogi Commission came out with a report in the 1950s. And based on those report, a lot of states in India uh, came out with anti-conversion laws. And then the saga has continued over a period of time. And uh, uh, Mr. Arun Shori published uh, you know, once uh, uh, in, the in the year 1992, Arun Shori was uh, 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 invited by the Christian uh, bishops in uh, Pune to address, uh, give them a keynote address about their All India meeting. And in um, preparation for that meeting, the, the, the Padres had actually uh, uh, got together and made a report uh, with All India kind of numbers and all of those things. So Arun Shori asked for a copy of that uh, report. And uh, he made use of that report to uh, write a book on uh, missionaries in India, kind of conversion, continuity, and belief. And that became quite a kind of a politically uh, uh, kind of a, uh, uh, a book that created a lot of, generated a lot of discussion. And, and conversion is uh, uh, also in the context of right now, conversion is uh, taking uh, uh, the debate on conversion is taking different route in India. You have a uh, talk on love jihad and, and whatnot. Everything is a jihad these days. <laughs> you have a narcotic jihad or love jihad. Or, um, uh, uh, the other day I came, or, came across another halal, uh, halal jihad. So whatever is uh, whatever is associated with Islam is a jihad right now, and then uh, connection is made with religious conversion. So it is it's important for us to uh, to know uh, where we stand with regard to this. Number one, the issue is uh, with regard to uh, see the people differ. Uh, what is your ideology? You uh, based on that ideology, you differ on this one particular question. The the uh, the the Bahujan of India, the uh, the ex untouchable castes and the tribes, the indigenous communities, were they Hindus? That's the basic question. And this question has been uh, quite politically charged. Now, if you look at Babasaheb Ambedkar, is uh, a central figure in 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 finding an answer to this. 
Baba Sahib Ambedkar, um, yeah, when, he, uh, uh, when he started his treatise on caste published in 1916, caste in India, the genesis and all of that, after that, he had a series of movements that he held uh, to, to find a place for the untouchable communities within the Hindu fold. You, you know the Mahat Satyagraha, you know the Chaudar Talab, you, you know about the Kalaram tem Temple Satyagraha in Nasik, you have the Parvati Hills uh, Satyagraha in Pune. Uh, these were the main ones. So he had a series of Satyagrahas where uh, he had made an attempt to find uh, a, a place for the untouchable communities on par with the other castes within the Hindu fold. And he failed. Every one of his satyagraha has ended in a flashpoint of violence, including the Chaudar Talab incident after um, uh, the, the, the ringing of the bell from the Talab was done. Um, the, the Brahmins got together and purified the entire area and uh, they complained to the, the civic administration and there were prohibitory orders and all of that. So by the time of 1935, even before that, even uh, before that, Baba Sahib Ambedkar uh, was very, very clear that ideologically, religiously, and in other ways, the untouchable castes of India are not part no. of the Hindu fold. And if they were part of the Hindu fold, they would have been treated at, uh, with some kind of uh, a kind of uh, an inclusiveness. So Baba Sahib Ambedkar in his book, who are the who were the scheduled caste and how did they came to uh, who were the Shudras and then who were the scheduled caste? Both of these books, in in, in those books you say like um, the the division the division in the in the community. So uh, we uh, he said the Hindu doesn't think of one community. There is no one um, Hindu kind of an identity. And he said that even if you look at the topography and the geography of Indian villages. The untouchable castes live in uh, at the edges of the villages uh, who are Antiyavasi or Antiyaja. So there is uh, a, a geographical, a physical division, a cultural division, and a social division, and a religious division. And therefore, the untouchables are not part of the Hindu fold. And that was the, the kind of uh, a difference that he had with uh, Gandhi uh, during the round table conference as well. So that is one, one, one uh, fact. The second thing is about the status of the indigenous communities. The indigenous communities, uh, uh, according to many of the uh, classical anthropologists, they have their own religious systems, which is uh, which some of them named it animism. But we can have uh, we can say that indigenous communities and tribal communities in India have their own independent religious beliefs and practices. And uh, anthropologist Nirmal Kumar Bose. Uh, in the 1940s came out with a thesis which he developed out of his field work in Odi Odisha and Bengal mainly, where he talked about, uh, he developed a concept called the Hindu method of tribal absorption. Uh, through his uh, ethnography, he uh, came out with this kind of a findings to so show that how certain indigenous communities over a period of time became Hinduized and what is that process and how does it happen so vividly portrayed in his book, The Structure of Hindu Society, which was originally published in Bengali, now the English translation is available. So that, the, so, uh, and then the debate between Barrier Elbin and G.S. Gurye on uh, G.S. Gurye, uh, the way that uh, he gave a blanket term for all indigenous communities in India as backward Hindus, uh, to, to saying that all indigenous communities in India, whatever their belief systems, they are part of the Hindu system uh, ultimately, and uh, Barrier Elbin actually deferred from that. So there is Baba Sahib, um, the, the Gandhi Ambedkar debate, there is a um, Gurye uh, Elvin debate, Gandhi Ambedkar debate in terms of um, ex untouchable caste, and Gurye Elvin debate in terms of the indigenous communities. Now, if um, the, the ex untouchable castes are not part of the larger Hindu fold, and if tribal communities are not part of the larger Hindu fold, and if these communities have their own independent belief systems, whether they become Hindu or, or whether they become Islamic or Muslim or whether they become Christian or whether they become Buddhist or Jain or whatever religion, um, it, it should be perfectly fine because uh, uh, it is a conversion. You can call it a conversion. You can call it assimilation. You can call it whatever word you want to use. It's a, it's a shift from their indigenous belief system to something different or their indigenous belief systems are getting co-opted into a larger religious uh, universe of Hinduism or Christianity or Islam or something like this. So that's the, that's the way in which we can actually look at religious conversion if you go by the argument of Baba Sahib Ambedkar and Barry Relvin and a whole lot of others.
But if you uh, take uh, a count, uh, a point of Gandhi and uh, um, Gure and uh, a whole lot of people of that kind, then we would you would look at conversion differently, and then you would say that uh, uh, by the the virtue of indigenous communities and Dalits being part of the soil of the South Asia, what is Bharatvarsh, as we say. Uh, whatever their belief systems, they are at the end of the day Hindu in some way. And therefore, um, in, in a very loose sense, uh, loose sense, though they are Antiyavasi, though they are Antiyaja, though they cannot, uh, uh, they cannot because of their uh, impurity or whatever, they cannot be part of us, cannot enter our temples, cannot be uh, on par with us. All that is true, but they are still Hindus. And therefore, if they are becoming Christian, if they are becoming uh, Muslim, if they are becoming something else, it is a conversion. And it is a conversion to something very un-Indian, something very foreign, and therefore anti-national, or therefore their allegiance becomes uh, to somewhere else, and therefore they become enemies of the nation and enemies of Hindu religion. So that is another way of looking at conversion. Now, there are two. these are two different ways. And uh, in between, the, you can have any kind of a multiple ways of looking at religious conversion. So that is uh, one way that uh, I would say that we can approach the issue of conversion. So it depends. What is your ideology? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Abha. Also, like it's interesting how like the how law and the how law and the constitution has a role to play in that. Like on one way, the constitution you know tells people that it is okay for them to practice their religion, profess their religion, discuss their religion. And on the other way, when the state is actually acting out, you know, in a very administrative bureaucratic kind of sense, they are sort of, you know, uh, like creating documents where they will document people of indigenous community as Hindu, or they will document, and that is complete invisibilization of what the indigenous people uh, are and what identity they stand for. To coming to the, the role of the state, as uh, you mentioned, that is entirely another picture there. A couple of things that I would like to point out. One thing that you already said about the census, where uh, the bureaucrats who were, um, or the, anyone who was employed for census, uh, they, they would categorize Dalits, Dalit communities or extant untouchable communities and Adivasi and indigenous communities are Hindu, if they did not mention that they are Christian or Muslim. Anything else, it just meant Hindu. So that is a that's a way of uh, a, a way of actually numbering people, enumerating population, as Foucault would say, uh, a function of governmentality, which which has which has happened in every census, and uh, all of these percentages have been talked about by everyone. So that's that's one aspect. The second aspect is with regard to the provision of compensatory discrimination that we call uh, reservations in India. Uh, the presidential order, which actually promulgated the, 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 the reservation, said that reservation would apply to only uh, Dalits. And uh, Dalits, actually, uh, the SCs, actually the scheduled caste, that's the word used, who are, who are part of the Hindu society. And if you are uh, belonging to some categorization of that kind, and if you are a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Jain or whatever, uh, you would not be uh, uh, eligible for reservation in jobs and reservation in educational institutions. But in the, in, the, in the case of scheduled tribes, this particular distinction did not apply. A scheduled tribe had reservation, whichever religion that you belong to. And then a change in this presidential uh, uh, proclamation or uh, promulgation was uh, brought about by the Janta Dal government of uh, Prime Minister V.P. Singh in the year 1991 where uh, the, the word Hindu was um, made large enough to involve, include also Sikh, Buddhist, and Jain uh, religions. But still, uh, Islam and Christianity um, very clearly got excluded. And therefore, if you uh, are, a, uh, are an SC community, and if you convert to his Christian, and you name yourself as a Christian in the census, uh, you come into the open category, and in some states, you become part of the OBC if the state has uh, included your jati into that OBC list. Otherwise, and also, the Dalits who converted to Christianity and Islam, they also don't get yeah. uh, reservation. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. They that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And, yeah. and but so, in some states, some j Dalit jatis are included in the OBC list now. Hmm. Uh, so that uh, not not everyone. So so that so that there is a way in which the state 
actively discriminates against uh, Dalits who have got converted uh, to Christianity and Islam, uh, implying that. Now, now, this is not the state alone. Uh, some Christians and many Christians and Muslims also support this because they say that Christianity is an egalitarian religion, unlike Hinduism. They will say Islam is an egalitarian religion, unlike Hinduism, and there is no caste discrimination. And the government also says, fine, that's true. You, uh, you, uh, if you are not part of the Hindu system, uh, how do you actually justify you asking for reservation? But the lived reality of Dalitness in Christianity and Islam, which is documented by any number of uh, ethnographic studies, uh, whether it is the case of uh, uh, in Bihar, many of, uh, for example, the halal core in uh, UP or, or many of the converted Christians across uh, India, uh, the, the fact of discrimination continues in their uh, newfound religions. So that so that there is a way through the naming of uh, religious identities in the census and, uh, and through the, the sort of uh, anti-conversion laws passed by different states in India, and, and through the ways in which the entire uh, provision of compensatory discrimination has been defined uh, in India, these three in these three ways, the state has actively um, um, uh, uh, yeah, come into the, this entire process of conversion. And uh, in addition to this, now uh, now you have uh, the the state of Uttar Pradesh and the state uh, of Gujarat right now. They have. Uh, kind of laws for registration of marriages, uh, where if it is an inter-religious marriage, uh, the, the conversion has to be certified by a magistrate before uh, the marriage can be actually registered. Uh, yesterday, there was a ruling from the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court told the UP government, you can't do that. Marriage registration cannot wait for your magistrate's uh, certificate of conversion. So that's the ruling which has come yesterday. So uh, the, the entire uh, bogey of love jihad and based on the bogey of love jihad, there are legislations actually put in place by some state governments, which are also uh, making this, uh, this entire issue of uh, conversions complicated. Now, the, the another issue or what I wanted to uh, say is that largely um, uh, people who are studying religion make a distinction between uh, this is a favorite uh, kind of a category that I have uh, read Ashish Nandi and, and also uh, T.N. Madan use this term, <clears throat> both of them make a distinction between uh, proselytizing religions and non-proselytizing religions. So they would categorize Islam and Christianity as actively proselytizing, actively uh, looking so for- So can you explain a little bit about what proselytizing is? Yeah, proselytizing, uh, the term means that uh, someone who uh, actively promotes other people into their religious belief, that is proselytization, actively doing it. And obviously uh, Christianity, for example, I being a Christian uh, uh, priest, I can say very clearly, ideologically Christianity actively proselytizes. Christianity actually says that, Okay, um, uh, uh, Jesus Christ is uh, sent by God, he's the son of God, and therefore uh, there is a way in which uh, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, it's a unique way of uh, being in touch with God, and therefore it is nice that if you people can join me kind of thing. Okay, <laughs> so that is there, that I, I, that's ideologically there. And uh, there is also the way uh, uh, in Islam, uh, there is a way in which Islam is open to conversion. But the point is, the point is, uh, Hinduism is very different. We need to understand that there is a way in which the worldview and the structure of um, Semitic religions, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and associated religions, and the structure of religions which are called Indic, uh, T.N. Madan uses the word Indic, religions which have evolved uh, in this land of South Asia, which are called Indic. These two have got entirely uh, very different worldview. So where uh, Islam and Christianity particularly are religions uh, which have got a very clear kind of uh, belief system, very clear kind of uh, a structure in place and where uh, people joining them becomes such a huge enterprise. Whereas, in, uh, for example, in uh, Sikhism or Hinduism for that matter, um, uh, so uh, for example, and that is why in Hinduism, the process of conversion is named as assimilation. Like, for example, suppose you are a, a non-Hindu person or a non-Hindu community, for example, a tribal community or something like that. You are closely in touch with uh, Hindu uh, kind of beliefs and practices 
and therefore slowly your gods and goddesses become as absorbed in the larger hindu pantheon as uh, avatars and vehicles and all of that vehicles of ganesha for example vehicle of shiva for example avatar of shiva for example in that case it is this very open in that sense so there is a way in which a whole lot of different religious systems can get absorbed into the larger hindu fold and become hindu now is that not uh, like conversion you don't say the word conversion you say assimilation but the process is similar right so uh, so so we have to look at it in a very larger kind of a canvas uh, so so there is a process of assimilation there is a process of conversion and conversion is a very clear kind of a thing uh, which gets associated with semitic religions assimilation is something that happens with regard to um, uh, most indic religions because indic religions are much more inclusive but there is one thing that makes uh, hinduism very specifically and also to some extent jainism a uh, very exclusive uh, exclusive as well because in terms of creed hinduism is very inclusive but in terms of social structure hinduism is very very exclusive it's very exclusionary because uh, uh, the the hindu social structure of uh, jati and varna and the jati based practices and the way that jati has taken on different forms over a period of time and become very very robust uh, that becomes the way in which hinduism is practiced so you we cannot uh, when we say hinduism is a very inclusive religion it's a very open kind of religion and it is may not be a, a religion it's a way of life very true but only in in, in creed in terms of belief but in terms of the way hinduism is practiced it is through the practice of jati and and there it becomes much more limited and much more uh, with uh, 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 with ideas of purity pollution ideas of exclusion ideas of occupational specialization ideas of uh, 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 all these gunas and uh, you know sattva rajas tamas get up uh, gets uh, uh, apply, applied to people apply to anything a whole lot of things come in so we need to look at religious conversions uh from this larger canvas rather than you know get carried away by the political bogey that is all over uh, and which which has itself got some validity i'm not i'm not denying all of that yeah yeah abha you want to say something yeah also like when you were saying that it's inclusive in terms of creed i was wondering how because one of like the principles also that hinduism kind of stands by i don't know if it was in later hinduism or uh, in early am i audible to you you are audible you are audible yeah so there was also this like perception or there is this principle and even there is this theory where people say that for somebody to be a hindu you have to be born a hindu so how exactly do we understand that like how do we understand creed then and how do we understand inclusion or is it just assimilation then Uh, again when uh, when someone also says, one more, one more second one more minute like before we uh, like proceed further i just want to make it clear like what assimilation really means assimilation is something when something that does not belong to uh, a certain kind of uh, a category for instance is forcefully like the category is sort of redefined and then uh, something else is brought into the system the independence of that but the the other that is brought into the system is not sort of recognized and that otherness that difference is uh, uh that difference uh is not recognized and it is just sim- and then it is subsumed or it is included in the category as a as a part of the category so that is what assimilation is and now we can move forward. i yeah. mean you can correct me joseph sir if i'm wrong no uh, see what you said that uh, one is, one does not become a hindu but one is born into uh, born a hindu that again is not actually referring to creed it is mm. referring to caste mm. it is referring to caste because what what is actually determined by birth not creed it's your caste so um, but at the same time there are there are uh, modern uh, hindu sects like panth uh, who are actually open to uh, other people joining them like mahesh yogis transcendental meditation or hare rama hare krishna uh, there are uh, like for example art of living for example there are uh, now uh, kind of hindu uh, kind of practices and sects which are actually uh, you don't have to be born a hindu to be part of it hmm. 
there are ways in which you can actually join them. They have specific rights of uh, uh, inclusion in, and, and becoming a Hindu and all of that. And, and th that is also individual uh, conversion. It's not a community, it's not a tribe, it's not a caste, it's, it's an individual person who can of his or her own free will become a Hindu through some of these practices right now. So when we are talking about uh, uh, that, we need to also take into consideration these modern contemporary uh, Hindu sectarian movements, which are actually uh, also open to conversion. Yeah. It's not just assimilation alone, that, that's one. And coming back to assimilation, yes. Um, uh, see this entire uh, way of uh, myth-making, you know, like, like every, uh, uh, every caste, every kul, every jati has its own myths of origin. And then uh, there is a way in which some of these myths of origin, their gods and goddesses can eventually get connected into the larger Hindu fold. And there are studies like, there are historical studies where people have talked about uh, some of these very popular deities across India today. Uh, there are ways like, for example, Vitoba um, uh, uh, of Pandarpur. Uh, there are studies which show that it was never uh, he uh, it was uh, he was a a, a, a a tribal god or god of a particular community got Hinduized and became an uh, a Vishnu uh, based avatar much later and and, and there, there are studies which show that and and there are studies uh, uh, across India of this kind of uh, ways in which certain uh, tribal indigenous community based village based deities became part of the larger Hindu pantheon. Yeah, and uh, that's one. But um, uh, what happens to a, a community which becomes part of the larger Hindu fold? Uh, N.K. Bose's work, again, is very crucial here, where N.K. Bose says that, suppose a particular tribal community is uh, specialized in basket making or pot making, and uh, when they get uh, uh, assimilated into the Hindu fold, uh, they get uh, associated with that particular occupation. And then uh, usually they are accommodated into the lower rungs of the Hindu caste hierarchy, which is usually uh, the, the two caste hierarchy, Varna hierarchies, uh, in addition to the Panchma, which is untouchable, which had this kind of uh, little kind of inclusive character in terms of Varna is one is Sudra and the other one is Chatriya. Uh, like for example, a lot of communities in India today claim Chatriya hood uh, and uh, whether they are, others accept them or not, claim is made. The same way, the Shudra category being an artisanal category, people with different occupational specializations could claim, claim their kind of a place in the Shudra category or the untouchable category. And that is how the entire assimilation process used to happen um, historically, if you look at it. So, you know, like uh, the, 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 the Mughal period and the British period, um, if, largely, if you look at in India, and obviously we need to know that all of India was not part of the British directly, somewhere indirectly and somewhere even independent and somewhere under the Portuguese or the French even that time. So there is a, a larger movement in which all of these movements happened, either movements towards uh, movements of conversion towards Christianity or Islam or movements of assimilation towards Hinduism, uh, all of that. So that is where the larger picture of conversion that we can uh, look at, uh, look in India right now. Yeah. I think Dinesh has something to say. Yeah. Sure. Yes, sir. Okay. Actually, sir, you told about the proselytism in India that the conversion of Islam and uh, Christianity, uh, people are converting a lot of into these religions. But again, sir, at the other part, uh, there is a movement going should the uh, movement like Arya Samaj is also taken voluntarily into it and they are reconverting these people into Hindu. <laughs> and at the part again, you told that uh, uh, this art of living, the Shishi Ravi Shankar, and you don't have to born Hindu for being a Hindu. So what's the like, uh, how we can connect these two points? Like at one point, we don't even need to be Hindu. And at other point, again, the Shuddhi movements are going to show that uh, you have to reconvert from Islam and Christian to Hindu. So how we can connect these two dots? Though? Okay, <laughs> thank you for that uh, intervention. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, see, like when I talked about Mahesh Yogi or uh, uh, Iskon or Art of Living, uh, there is a way in which if I'm a Christian, I can be part of the Art of Living Foundation. and uh, But I, uh, that's the way in which I become Hindu. It, it, it's a way conversion is happening. Actually, all right. Uh, so especially, for example, ISKCON is much more uh, very clear. Okay. Uh, so, so there is a way in which these movements within Hinduism are something that is, uh, is a modern movements. And they are modeled uh, like 
uh, movements in Christianity, missionary movements in Christianity. They're modeled in that in that way, uh, as long as far as the conversion fact is concerned. The rest of the things are different. Okay, that's one. Now coming to Arya Samaj. Um, Arya Samaj is not only about Shuddhi. They, are, they, have, they had two programs, uh, Gharvapsi and Shuddhi. Okay, uh, and, and both of these programs, uh, Swami Dhanan Saraswati himself started and he had uh, his book, Sadhyat Prakash, in which he uh, laid down the ideology behind Arya Samaj. But the Arya Samaj was also for the Shuddhi of Hinduism because um, uh, Arya Samaj's number one slogan was back to the Vedas. The idea was that Vedic religion was the pure Hindu religion. Uh, which did not have this kind of too many jatis there. It had Varna, but Varna idea was just about a categorization of occupation and others without the kind of discrimination and uh, stigmatization that happened later. So the idea of that Vedic religion as the pure Hindu religion with only Varna, but no jati, and the idea that uh, Vedic religion did not have idol worship. Arya Samaj from the very beginning till today, is anti-idol worship, anti-idol worship. So, so and, and in that sense, Ari Samaj was in a sense the, the missionary Hinduism in Northwestern India, you know, Punjab, Haryana, uh, parts of Rajasthan, parts of Western Uttar Pradesh, a whole lot of communities in that area became, uh, com, uh, became part of the Hindu fold. Now, later they developed obviously idol system. They became like normal Hindus later, but initially it was the, missionary efforts of Arya Samaj uh, that, uh, you know, made it happen. And obviously, as you said, Arya Samaj also had the program of Shuddhi and Garvapsi. But in ter terms of numbers, you know, it, it was very negligible. But in terms of numbers, the way Arya Samaj influenced a lot of uh, uh, independent co indigenous communities of those areas to be part of the Hindu fold is phenomenal in terms of numbers. So Arya Samaj was a missionary Hindu enterprise in that sense, okay? And later, obviously, Garvapsi and Sudhi becomes a program which has its uh, its relevance even today. But in terms of numbers, it's very neg negligible. You, I mean, it, they, they get headlines, you know, because I don't know why people are so much charged about this conversion, reconversion process in India. One thing about we South Asians, Indians, you know, we have too, we are too much into this religion business, you know? So... So there is a way in which uh, uh, whatever is connected to religion, it gets headlines. And I don't know why it should be that way. So so that is... Uh, the, the, the no, sir, way. actually, uh, somewhere even uh, Yogi uh, Adityanath uh, CM has uh, spoken about this thing in Aapki Adalat that I've already converted uh, more than 200 people into from uh, Muslim to Hindu. And I'll be carrying this. So from that part, it like moved a uh, like blog into the papers. So everybody started thinking, Acha, people are coming back to Hindu. So this should be movement are even taken by the politicians also. So this was the thing. Surely, because uh, there was this Dilip Singh Judeo yeah. uh, in Judev, Judev in uh, Chhattisgarh. Hmm. He is someone who started this Garvapsi program in Chhattisgarh among the tribals who had converted to Christianity uh, in the 90s, 80s and 90s. And uh, so th th that is happening in different parts of India uh, as, as a program. And why not? Why not? I mean, if uh, religion should have the freedom to uh, to convert or reconvert, obviously, uh, I mean, uh, the, the constitution should give that freedom, and uh, and that's quite fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Uh, so, shall I move to the Buddhist conversion now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now. Um, uh, the uh, the Buddhist conversion. Uh, that this has been uh, my uh, the topic of my uh, PhD in uh, Delhi University, Delhi School of Economics, where I completed my doctoral studies, and I did extensive kind of field work in Aurangabad, the city of Aurangabad in Maharashtra, and um, so it is based on that field work and my readings that I'm, what I'm going to say. Now, um, uh, why Buddhism? Uh, that has been a, a big question because Baba Sahib Ambedkar declared in 1935 after all these campaigns that he tried with temple entry movements and drinking of water in Chaudar Talab and all of these, by 1935 in a place called Yavla uh, in uh, Maharashtra, he declared that uh, I was born a Hindu. I had no choice. I have a choice now. I will not die a Hindu. So he declared his intent to convert. But he never said uh, which religion he is not going to convert. And he actively, actively uh, examined uh, the pros and cons of Converting to different religions, he uh, 
uh, obviously the the christian um, uh, some of these christian missionaries were the the first ones to get very uh, excited about it uh, he, they went and met him and said you know christianity is that christianity is this and all of that so uh, uh, baba saheb ambedkar I, i i heard from one person who uh, who uh, was an associate of ss rage who was secretary of baba saheb ambedkar where baba saheb ambedkar asked uh, this christian uh, people uh, sh- show me which part version of the bible do you follow so uh, one of them sh- uh, showed a version of the bible and then baba saheb ambedkar said but this is not the bible that i am familiar with so you have di- different bibles and different christianities so which christianity do you want me to convert number one and then he wrote a book called the condition of the convert and he said that uh, christian uh, christianity in india does not have a pan indian identity it is a very regional identity and it is uh, people who have converted to christianity have not been able to get out of the uh, the the violence of the caste system the, the disability of the caste system so he ruled out christianity quite early then he uh, uh, toyed with the idea of islam but one religion he gave a lot of uh, uh, consideration was sikhism actually so he sent his son yashwant to amritsar and uh, uh, the sikh community uh, accepted him yashwant lived there for some years and uh, then baba saheb again uh, did not um, come to uh, sikhism because of uh, its uh, regional association but also the way that uh, ramdasia sikhs and jat sikhs uh, consider uh, practice um, exclusion and uh, uh, caste like kind of practices and therefore baba saheb made the rule that out and and that is the time when um, baba saheb ambedkar already had an exposure to buddhism quite early and uh, that's the time then he seriously started considering buddhism now buddhism in in a sense actually lent itself into uh, this kind of uh, thing because there was no significant living community of buddhists in india uh, at that time and uh, and therefore it gave baba saheb ambedkar that kind of a freedom and uh, what baba saheb ambedkar did is that uh, he had certain very critical historical studies into the history of buddhism and he also did a textual analysis of the buddhist texts and he and he very clearly actually if you read uh, his his uh, article the buddha and the future of his religion in that he says that over a period of time a lot of brahmanical uh, caste based ideas got into buddhism and over a period of time a lot of uh, uh god based divine divinity based ideas came into buddhism the notion of avatar and all of that which he said was never part of historical buddhism so he uh, took on a project of uh, uh, interpreting buddhism in a very different way and you know at the eve of his conversion october 14 1956 on october 13 in a, he gave an interview to the bbc in which he said that uh, i am not getting converted to Uh, any traditional buddhism i'm not getting converted to mahayana i'm not getting converted to theravada i'm con- i'm i'm getting converted to the original historical buddhism the undefiled buddhism the buddhism that has not been defiled by brahmanism or the caste practices or the practices of divinity and all of that i'm getting converted to that buddhism which is based on the principles of democratic politics principles of democracy the buddha my master the principles on which the buddha lived the principles on which the buddha preached his dhamma are the principles of fraternity equality and liberty and that those principles are completely amenable to the modern democratic polity so we i and my people we are looking for dignity we are looking for equality we are looking for fraternity and we are looking for uh, participation in the democratic process of this country as human beings with uh, human value and justice uh, and the principles of justice and the principles of buddhism the ideals preached by lord buddha actually are very much providing this and therefore i am converting uh, getting myself converted to the original historical buddhism uh, of the buddha and it is based on this particular statement 
that people later started giving uh, a different uh, nomenclature to uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar and his followers who, are, who call themselves Buddha saying that Navayana Buddhism or Nau Bhaut Samaj or Neo Buddhism, whatever name that you have given to it. So, um, so and, and you know, when you, when you read the Buddha and his Dhamma, the, the text, actually Baba Sahib Ambedkar did not have enough uh, time to prepare that text because um, what I've read of his biography is that from 1948, he was very sick and uh, he was highly diabetic and uh, his uh, second wife, uh, Kabir, um, uh, actually uh, was uh, tending to him. And uh, uh, towards the end of his life, you know, um, I, have, I have read his biography where he had a uh, gangrene sitting on his foot and he used to tie his foot up uh, and, 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 and work on this text, the Buddha and his Dhamma. And uh, he has not completely, uh, um, uh, he has not, he was not able to complete it fully, but, and it was published posthumously. But you can see uh, in the prologue of that book very clearly uh, sets an agenda. And in the prologue of the book, and, and that's the way in which Baba Sahib Ambedkar interprets Buddhism for modern India, not, not just for Dalits, actually, if you look at that entire book, if you read Buddha and the future of his religion, if you read Buddha and his Dhamma, the way in which Baba Sahib Ambedkar uh, proposes Buddhism is not just for Dalits, it's not for Mahats alone, it's not for his community alone. He proposes Buddhism as the religion which is modern and which is most suitable for a, a democratic country like India, a democratic religion, a religion which is based on science and reason. Uh, 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 and, and that's the way he proposes it. And obviously, uh, uh, people who converted along with him are basically people of his jati. Obviously, in India, everything goes by jati. And even this movement got restricted to, to a great extent on one jati. But we should know that there was a movement among the jat of Sinagra, a similar movement. There are any number of movements happening in different parts of India from that time onwards till today, where larger numbers of people are getting converted into Buddhism, Buddhism of Baba Sahib, the way that he has imagined the Buddhism to be. And also, there is a precursor to this. There's a, there is another movement, a similar movement, which, which took shape in the 1905 in Chennai, Madras of that time, and the Kolar Goldfield area, where uh, uh, a, a group of people mainly belonging to the scheduled caste of Paravars, uh, they they got they became Buddhists and they called themselves Shakya Buddhist or South Indian Buddhist and the founder of that religion was someone called Pandit Ayotitas and one of the intellectuals of that particular Buddhism called Lakshmi Narasu uh, like Baba Sahib Ambedkar's Buddha and his Dhamma Lakshmi Narasu wrote uh, an interpreted modern Buddhism uh, the title of the book is the essence of Buddhism. And uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar wrote a foreword to that reprint in 1948. So there is, there has been a, uh, a, a, something that happened. But over a period of time, South Indian Buddhism as a living religious practice fizzled out by the time India became independent. And, and, and that's, in, in that sense, Baba Sahib Ambedkar positions Buddhism very differently. Like coming back to the prologue of that book, Baba Sahib Ambedkar says that uh, uh, original Buddhism could not have been based on the four noble truths. He says that if you read the Four Noble Truths, what is it? Life is sorrow, that is sorrow, everything is sorrow. It is very pessimistic. The Buddha wouldn't have said it. But if you look at, uh, if you look at the other sayings of the Buddha, it doesn't uh, uh, say anything about this. So he says that uh, the kind of Buddhism that I am getting converted into, it is not based on this pessimistic idea of the Four Noble Truths. Then he says, then he says uh, the, the, the question of why did Buddha leave and go? Uh, Kapilavastu. He says that the Buddha, uh, traditionally they say the Buddha was protected from all sorrow and then Buddha saw uh, a sick person and a dead body and all of that. Uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar says that is rubbish. How can, a, uh, how can a person who lives life those many years not be aware of sickness, not be aware of death? It's completely illogical. He says that the Buddha left Kapilavastu because the Buddha tried, Buddha was a person of peace. Buddha was a person of debate and deliberation. And when the Shakyas and Kolyas were going to war with each other, Buddha sat with them to find a way out. They said, let's debate this out. Let's find a way out. They did not want it. He said, in that case, I go. He says, this is what happened. This is what happened. 
So there are a, uh, there are a couple of uh, four or five things like that he puts down in that book very very clearly, and then he uh, has entire sections on what he calls what is dhamma. He says dhamma is not not religion. Dhamma and religion are two different things. He says that uh, there is an argument which he picks up from annihilation of caste and brings into this book when he talks about dhamma and makes dhamma as very different from religion. He says that religion. Uh, he says that there are two types of religions in the world. There are religion of principles and religion of rules, and he says that most religions are religions of rules because it's about you. You you can't eat that. You can eat this. You can't do that. You can do this. You cannot touch that person. You can touch this person. You cannot get married to that person. You can get married to this person. So religions are about rules. Is that Buddha's Dhamma is a religion of principles. It's not about rules. It's about rationality it's about debate it's about discussion it's about the principles of equality liberty fraternity and social justice and then he has in that section on vinaya he has a section on uh, sadhama he has a section on karma as the, the buddha would understand it so uh, yeah uh, yeah manisha singh has a very interesting question i will come to that i will come to that I, I, thank you for raising that question so there is a way in which baba saheb ambedkar uh, interprets buddhism in a, in a in a very very modern sense uh, and propositions it as the religion most suited for modern democratic social life and uh, uh, the entire text he takes pains to uh, impress upon us impress upon the reader that the buddha were practiced and taught his followers to practice democracy and debate and discussion at all levels and for that he says that the first the first sermon of the buddha the the the, the in the english translation of that sermon is the, the sermon at the deer park i forget the pali term for that uh, where he uh, told the the first five followers of the buddha you know uh, they they said the, they were of the brahmin caste and things like that uh, when he talked when he uh, talked about the enlightenment that he got to this first uh, five followers he he says that in that particular sermon that um, just because i am saying this please don't follow i don't have i don't have anything exceptional what i have uh, uh, the enlightenment that i have got is through certain efforts of mine you apply it to your intellect you think it over if you find it valuable take it if you don't find it valuable in your in your rational rationalizing leave it so baba saheb ambedkar uh, uh, talks about repeats this and he says that buddha wanted even buddha's uh, uh, making of the sangha for example baba saheb ambedkar says the sangha was the most democratic organization everything was debated and discussed and the sangha was inclusive in that sense and then uh, baba saheb ambedkar says that over a period of time a lot of ritualistic rule based religious ideas came into the sangha and the sangha got uh, very very divinized it became something otherworldly so in in his book buddha in his article buddha and the Fu future of his religion he says that the ideal monk of today's world is a social worker a samaj sevak not someone who renounces uh, the society and moves away so the ideal monk is the samaj sevak and that's the way the buddha envisioned it very interesting way of uh, interpreting who is a monk what is dhamma what is the four noble truths and and what is uh, why did the buddha leave the palace all of that and then this particular trend is carried in the, in the way that he actually positions uh, buddhism and it is to this buddhism that he got converted now i take uh, manisha singh's question there how is buddhism introduced by baba saheb ambedkar you have is it different from nikhiran buddhism very similar very similar i don't have too much of expertise in nikhiran buddhism but across the world not just in india across the world buddhism has been one religion which has given rise to uh, a, a different type of buddhism with regional specifications across the world uh scholars have given it uh, two names to it they call it engaged buddhism someone who has done extensive studies on this two of them that is christopher queen and Sa sally king queen and king uh they have books on uh, engaged buddhism uh, any number of books 
and uh, Nikhilin Buddhism is uh, they have named it as one of them. Like you know, Nikhilin Buddhism, um, some some uh, some uh, part of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, Sri Lanka, for example. There is this research done by Richard Gombrich, uh, who uh, talks about Protestant Buddhism in Sri Lanka. And uh, the, 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 the person of Anagarika Dhammapala, I'm pretty sure you have heard about him. Anagarika Dhammapala. Now, if you look at Anagarika Dhammapala, very much like Baba Sava Bedkar, he interpreted Buddhism to the modern world. Very, very similar on many counts. And therefore, Buddhism had a renewal in, uh, in part of Sri Lanka uh, with Anagarika Dhammapala. And, you know, uh, there was another person, I forget his name, uh, um, I forget his name. He combined Gandhian philosophy and Buddhist ethos and uh, started a movement in uh, Sri Lanka called Sarvodaya Shramadana. Sarvodaya Shramadana. So, uh, and Nikhilin Buddhism and, uh, and uh, um, even, even people, the figure of the Dalai Lama, people say to a great extent, the kind of uh, stand he takes on different issues is part of engaged Buddhism and not so much the traditional Mahayana beliefs and practices. So Buddhism uh, in that sense has been interpreted and made engaged. Now, if, if Buddhism or Nikhilin Buddhism and other types of Buddhism are engaged to Buddhism, what is the name that we would give to the Buddhism of Bhavasai? So that is where people have come out with another term called socially engaged Buddhism. Socially engaged Buddhism. And I would say that can be easily given for uh, Buddhism of Ayotitas, Buddhism of Anagariga Dhammapala, and Buddhism, Buddhist movements in many different countries where um, there has been a modern interpretation of Buddhism. Buddhism, the way that people have found in Buddhism the resources for a very, very modern uh, democratic lifestyle and democratic culture. Um, uh, that is what is socially engaged in Buddhism is. And therefore, the Nikran uh, uh, sect is part of such engagement. Yeah. Do we have any questions? Yeah. I think it's really interesting, you know, like uh, how Buddhism has been like sort of adopted by a lot of people for into their own context and made sense out of it for their own selves. And uh, yeah, like how like you just said, right? Like there is how Ambedkar did it to like sort of uh, move away from caste. Even like even Buddhism has a very vibrant history of uh, you know a lot of people in ancient ancient India as we now know it as India. Like a lot of South Asia had actually moved to Buddhism. Buddhism was one of the most practiced, uh, you know, uh, religions or philosophies at that point of time and because there was there was this hindu brahman lobby who was afraid that a lot of people will move away they sort of uh, you know brought about some kind of reforms within what hinduism must be like and incorporated different parts of different kinds of religious practices into that so that people you know stopped moving and moved back to hinduism or did not further go into buddhism and even how kings had a role to play in to ensure that a uh, lot of uh, like uh, Buddhist, uh, 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 you know, Buddhist stupas and all of those were, you know, sort of destroyed at some point. So there was a certain kind of antagonism, even historically between Buddhism and Hinduism, you know, where there was a certain kind of a contention between the two and how that actually eventually played a role in, in Baba Sahib's like, uh, you know, decision to convert to Buddhism. Like a lot of people, so I had a professor when I was at a university, uh, he he converted to Buddhism. He is a tribal from Meghalaya uh, himself and he converted to Buddhism. And when he used to talk to us about Buddhism, he said that at, at that time for Ambedkar, it was not so much of a philosophical kind of a movement more. It was like, a political thing you know for him it was like established like you even mentioned about polity like he brought about the idea of buddhist polity into uh, his conception of buddhism so it was more political but later you know later on people started talking about how like philosophy of buddhism and how it was relevant to uh, uh, relevant 
to uh, the people who wanted to move away from caste, you know, bringing in the idea of grief and pain that you get from society and how uh, even the even even the uh, 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 politics of Maitre, like Sangha and Maitre uh, community, the sense of community and all of that. So it's interesting how history has so much role to play in this. How history is not independent of different, how history is not independent of politics, how history is not independent of what the society is structured like. So all of this, you know, sort of merges and comes together time and again uh, at, at different points uh, in history. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, do we have a little more time or is it over? Uh, <laughs> how little is little? <laughs> uh, maybe uh, five minutes more and then a little more. I'll sure, you, you can, we can conclude with your five minutes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so taking that, uh, what you are saying a uh, little forward, uh, the way that uh, we intense practice caste today or we understand caste today, it was not um, uh, this, uh, this rigid or strict at any point in the past. And that is what is uh, the considered opinion of many scholars who have historically studied. Like Uma Chakravarti in, his, in her work on uh, ancient India, she talks about um, kind of evidence that we have of Ganas. And the Ganas were kind of communities. They did not have, there is no evidence of um, kind of practices with regard to purity and pollution at all among the Ganas. And um, later, uh, there are caste-like practices uh, which are uh, which are actually uh, Irfan Habib's work on the Mughal Empire. You have caste-like practices where he has found evidence for it, uh, or earlier some kind of studies in the Gupta Empire or Mauri Empire. Uh, some kind of evidences are there, but it is the argument of uh, Nicholas Dirks, for example, in his mind in his work Castes of Mind, that he says that the way that we understand uh, caste, the Varna Varna Vivastha and the local practices of it, it got named and recorded and rigid only with the uh, the British intervention, because uh, the British when it, when they came to rule India, to rule India they wanted to know India and therefore they they generated uh, knowledge about India and this knowledge about India for that they they largely relied on Brahmin sources, and the uh, and those sources again, you know, like the Pangar Gupta makes this uh, point very very clearly. At no point in time where uh, the the position of jatis in the Varna scale a decided affair. It was never a decided affair. It was always a question of claims and counterclaims. It was all an open-ended system, and once it was all recorded from the time of the census, uh, you know. Uh, Varna and Jati and uh, all of these began to get more fixed kind of categories. But also like it was also recorded like I I mean I'm a little skeptical of that argument like you know when people say that caste became more rigid with colonialism like obviously that I mean uh, yeah colonialism did have a role to play in sort of defining but I think like you said they were sort of defining what it was from the word of the Brahmin yeah, yeah. So there was already a certain rigid yeah. idea about a category. No, but that rigid idea was and, not a, a largely universally yeah. accepted idea. Yeah. And it was, when we are talking about it being written down, I think there is enough historical text when we talk about Smritis or when we talk about Manu's writings and all of that. I mean, his writings there, it is written down. So it is like when, when we are talking about this movement of uh, uh, when, when, when we are talking about when something is written down and it becomes, you know, sort of uh, rigidified or it, you know, when you say it's ingrained in stone, like there is a reason they say that, right? Like, because it there is a certain kind of permanency that becomes attached to it yeah. once it's done. Like the fluidity of it becomes sort of constrained. Yeah. Right. So it was written down. Like, you know, when people say that it was like uh, writing happened with the senses, I think it was written down before and with the senses and because of European power and European domination, it became like, like you said, it became a universally accepted idea it be, because the modern thought of European civilization is like that. But it being writing, written down and it being rigid was, I think, from before because we have historical evidence of 
the rigid practices of caste way before colonialism way way long much much before that so no, see what happened is it was not a, a, a universally accepted uh, thing you know like there was manushmriti there was purusha sukta all that was there but it was not something that was universally spread and accepted you know like when the census issue happened uh, different uh, jati started making claims about which varna we are and the british administrators administrators uh, they got all these petitions from numerous jatis and they had to decide and they decided and it became on paper you know like so these claims and counter claims were there in in so many intermediate kind of caste you know like uh, textually i agree there were rigidity before but those rigid rigid practices were not applied to everyone you know and it became much more universal because of the british intervention yeah. but that is also because caste is a very localized practice yeah, exactly caste, caste is, is practice a very as localized jati. practice it is practice as jati Ah, it's in, a in, very in localized local. practice. So this yeah. idea of universal thing, like that, is very as a European wala thing, na. Ke, ap matlab bolonge democracy, republic kaise samjhaye, democracy ko kaise samjhaye, even religion ko kaise samjhaye with Christianity or yeah, Abrahamic religions particularly. So wo us context se aata hai. But right. apart from that, uh, yeah. So that is basically something that I was trying to say. Ke wo. Uh, The, this is the kind of argument people usually make, you know, that the rigidity came with census, but it was not like that. Like because caste was such a localized practice, there were different kinds of practices that were existing in different kinds of geographical locations. The way caste would look in Maharashtra will be very different from the way, like how Pesh Peshwa uh, Peshwa or Gor Saraswat Brahmins would. practice caste in maharashtra will be very different from the way ayers and ayangars will practice caste in in tamil nadu or will be very different from how uh, even the dominant how marathas uh, practice caste who are, who are still coming from a lower caste or a dominated they were a dominating caste and a dominated caste so because caste is so localized there is uh you know like it looks very different in different places but the notions of what what who is what who can marry who who can be touched who cannot be touched who is pure who is impure who can eat what who cannot eat what those were the things that were quite like you know very ingrained in that sense they were very they were there were certain kind of norms Yeah, to sure. decide sure, sure. Okay, what is what because if that were the case then caste wouldn't have really existed the way it exists so. sure sure yeah um uh maybe a last word i like to say one more thing because uh, uh, the your question actually uh, brought it to my memory um it's about uh, when we uh, look at the history of india when we look at uh, religious specialists in that sense if we can call if we can use that term uh again i i borrow this from umar chakravarti there are two 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 traditions of religious specialists in india the brahmana tradition on the one hand and the shramana tradition on the other now the brahmana tradition is the tradition of the householder uh, a brahmin as a ritual specialist has to be a householder a brahmin as a renouncer and uh, the idea of renounce renunciation got associated with uh, brahmanism much later Absolutely. So initially, uh, Bra- Brahmanism was a, a completely ritual based kind of a, a category. Whereas and that, sh- and yeah. that actually kind of happened after Buddhism. Like, if I understand uh, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it yeah. was post Buddhism that I'm coming happened. to that. I'm coming yeah. to that. And okay. so the other one was the renouncer. The the Shramana was the renouncer, and the renouncer once you renounced, you know, categorically in a category wise, if you're a renouncer, you don't have caste. you are not a grihastha you are not a householder anymore mm. and and you are a shramana and a shramana uh, had a, a shramana renounces household renounces family renounces caste you know the uh, you don't ask a renouncer which caste you belong to even today okay because the renouncer doesn't have caste is a casteless person okay so the so when we come to religious specialists there is a clear tradition of the brahmana and the clear tradition of the shramana and jainism and buddhism very specifically are shramanic religious systems 
not Brahmanic religious systems. And then there were any number of other religious systems in India as well. So Brahmanism was one such system. Now, what happened is that uh, over a period of time, especially, uh, uh, see what happens is like religions, um, religious systems developed uh, to a great extent through Rajashraya, through the patronage of the kings. So uh, to a great extent, uh, uh, Brahmanism became much more uh, a favored religion of the kings and all of that much later. Some people attribute it to the, to the way in which uh, Shankara, Adi Shankara actually is part of this uh, uh, effort where Adi Shankara actually uh, uh, co-opted the revolutionary ideas of Buddhism and Jainism, which actually, uh, because of which a lot of people had for, I mean, followed Jainism and Buddhism, he co-opted some of those ideas and brought it into Brahmanism and made Brahmanism a kind of a powerful proposition and made it much more popular. So Babasa Ambedkar and also Gail Ombet, uh, who has uh, done extensive analysis of Ambedkar's writings. Uh, Ambedkar, for example, wrote an article called Revolution and Counter-Revolution. So Buddhism and Jainism as the religion of the Shramanas uh, after the Vedic times, Babasav Ambedkar calls this as revolution, revolution of the underclass because a religion, popular religions uh, whose ideals and whose religious specialists who are Shramanas actually catered to the underclass, uh, the Bahujan of that particular time. And then there is a counter revolution of Shankara and the Gupta kings where uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the force of revolution of Buddhism and Jainism got co-opted into Brahmanism, and Brahmanism became the most very powerful kind of a, uh, kind of a, a religion. And therefore, you see, from that historical perspective, if you look at Babasava Bedkar converting to Buddhism, it is not really conversion; it is really going back into that revolution, hmm. from counter-revolution back to revolution. So that's the way. Uh, counter, uh, counter, countering uh, counter-revolution. Countering counter-revolution. So that's the way in which uh, we can, and that is why Gail Ovet has this book, you know, uh, where he has, she has brought these arguments together, titled "The Seeking Begampura," uh, hmm. where Begampura is uh, taken from Kabir, Kabir's. Ravidas. Uh, 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 sorry, Ravidas. Ravidas, the idea of uh, Begampura, and then uh, bringing together all of these uh, Bahujan uh, kind of ideas into some kind of a perspective. So I just wanted to add add this to that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, it, it has been very, it, it was really nice to have be a part of this uh, session because it took me back to ethnography of religion. And uh, it took me back to like, and like uh, all the discussions that we had left off from, you know, before and it took me back there and it was uh, very, uh, hopefully uh, even the participants and the students for our course had uh, hopefully uh, learned something from it and have helped them understand, uh, you know, ancient history, modern history, polity, religion and polity together because all of these keep colliding within each other you know all the time so thank you joseph sir thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your thoughts with us and then so shall i uh, move out yes yes yeah, thank yeah. you thank you all, so much sir. Students, thanks a lot and all the best to you Thank you. Sir. Yeah, well, all the best, all the best. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good day, everyone.